Uh, we're talking to Yogendra Yadav, who's the national president of Swaraj India on uh, the Bihar election. He resents being asked about elections because it's not what he does anymore, but uh, force of habit, really. But I'm not going to ask you the questions that the other guys have asked you. So with that disclaimer, let me get started. Um, That's a good page. <laughs> we've, we've had several conversations about, um, you know, about what these numbers look like, what these numbers mean and all of that. So we're going to put that aside. Uh, I want to understand, as the rest of India, what we can read out of the voting patterns. First question. Is this a referendum or, you know, a thumbs up from the citizens for, let's say, the handling of COVID, uh, the uh, farm policies or the farm laws that were brought in right before these elections? The fact that the government has, has won back, both, you know, and, and let's be honest, uh, the prime minister was a large part of the campaign. Does this mean that the people of Bihar, at least, are happy with the handling of these two issues? Uh, Faye, in my uh, previous birth, my Purv Janam, uh, I used to say every time that political analysts, when they write about elections or when they interpret elections, before that, they should watch cricket commentary very closely. <laughs> because, I, I, and I seriously mean it, cricket commentary is always far more nuanced than political commentary. In no cricket commentary, at the end of the game, you would say that the team that won the match was had better batsmen, had better baller, also fielded well, and was lucky, and everything was right with it. No, no, no serious sports commentator would ever say something as silly as that. They would say, well, they kind of slackened in their bowling, but they made it up with batting, especially in the last five overs. And, but for that catch, they would have won. Things of that kind, you know. But in politics, and only in politics, you say that, the, 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 the party that managed to win five more seats than the other, which got 0.1% vote than the other, had everything right. They had good coalition, their caste arithmetic was better, their leadership was good, their uh, issues were right, and everything worked for the winner and everything flopped for the loser. I mean, nothing can be more idiotic than that. Uh, and that's something we need to remember. Uh, in this case, particularly in the case of Bihar, I had written, and I wrote it two weeks before the elections. So this is not a post facto wisdom. I had written to say that we must not read too much into this Bihar elections. And I had offered three reasons. One, because Bihar is no longer the epicenter of North India that it used to be in the 1990s, particularly. Two, because state politics in general, not just Bihar, state politics no longer reflects national trends ad, as it used to in the 1990s and 2000s. Those 20 years it used to, now it doesn't because state and national are two very different trends. And third, and most importantly, because elections are no longer the most happening things in our democracy. Some of the most important things are happening outside the parliamentary electoral arena. And this is a, something we need to remember at the end of the Bihar election. Yes, uh, NDA scraped through. There were good reasons why they did so. Remember that NDA did not get everything right and that Mahagadbandan did not get everything wrong. Otherwise the margin would have not been 0.1%, it would have been 12%, 15%, like it was in 2019. But to assume, so and therefore we must find a Bihar specific explanation. But to assume that because BJP and allies did better in Bihar, it follows that everything at the national level is all right, is completely outlandish. There is simply no basis to believe so. So we also know that the exit polls got it all wrong um, to, to some extent. It was not, like you said, it was not the exact opposite of what they had expected, but the margins were much thinner. Uh, Access My India that puts out the poll, uh, puts out one such poll, actually put out an apology in their press release today. But I just want to read out one portion of it. It said overall female voter turnout was 5% more than the men. And they basically said that the female voters voted 5% more in favor of the NDA. And because of COVID restrictions, we couldn't access them during our interviews. So my question is, are women voters going to become, or you know, is this a pattern? We know that in Bihar it matters because of prohibition and that matters to the women of Bihar. But will women begin playing a larger role as voters? Uh, will they become a, a, a you know, sort of constituency that matters a little more? 
I do not know if uh, women voters were the principal reasons why exit polls went wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Access My India poll has had a reasonably good track record. And polls with good track record can go wrong. They can make mistakes, as we saw in the US this time. And we don't need to come up with very convoluted reasons why some polls may go wrong. There are errors, there are mistakes, and they are built into statistics. However, it is absolutely right to say that women voters played a role. And the trouble is that in that entire discussion for 24 hours yesterday, almost no one mentioned it. And that gives, tells you something about how women are viewed by these manuals that discuss elections all the time. The simple fact is this, Nitish Kumar came up with prohibition policy. It was not a very smart public policy move but it really clicked with women. And I can guarantee you, Faye, I travel in the country, I speak to women all over. If women in this country were given political power for one single day, they would impose prohibition in this country. They're mm -hmm. sick and tired. When I travel in rural Haryana, Punjab, the one thing they say, beta hume MSP nahi chahiye, chhod do kuch nahi chahiye, bas daru band karwa do. So it clicked. Women were happy. Uh, they knew all the shortcomings of, other, of Nitish regime, not that they had their eyes closed, but someone had done something which they wanted to be done. Yes, the policy was not a grand success. As always, complete prohibition encourages smuggling. It encourages mafia. But having said all this, women thought Nitish was better. There are ground reports where women were saying, I would not vote the way my husband did. And Access My India poll, which has released the gender distribution, and I hope uh, CSDS also will tomorrow release gender distribution, it shows something very unusual, that uh, uh, if only men had voted, uh, NDA would have trailed by uh, one or two percentage. But because, but, and if only women had, had voted, NDA would have had an advantage of five points. So there is a huge gender gap in voting coupled with the fact that women came out more to vote. We do not know why, and it would be very hard to see, but one should guess that one of the reasons why women voted more, and Bihar has been notorious over the years in the past for women's turnout being substantially lower than men. This time women turned out more and they disproportionately favored uh, Nitish Kumar uh, and NDA government. So. Minimally, this, this one single fact should have accounted for about 2% of advantage for NDA, not only among women now. Two point difference between NDA and Mahagand Bandhan is explained by this one single fact. And what was the overall difference? When I checked it last, the overall difference between both the alliances is 0.1%. And this one factor explains 2%. So clearly, this is a very important fact that played a role. Uh, Nitish could make up for many of his mistakes. Uh, the alliance could make up for many of its failings. The fact that socially it's a weaker alliance than Yadav Muslim combined. They could make it up with uh, quoting women. And I, I would salute, I mean, I, I do not think I generally celebrate the victory of NDA, but on this one aspect, if women voters begin to turn elections, and if politicians begin to notice that women can turn elections, that's a great step forward in the country. That's about the only positive thing I notice in this election results. Yes. In fact, uh, you know, as a women's rights advocate myself, I believe that, uh, you know, women exercising their franchise is a big deal because now hopefully politicians will pay more closer attention to the needs of women and there'll be more, you know, more policy with women in mind maybe with more women in the room when policy is being decided, only good things can come of that. Um, Mr. Yadav, if we look forward now, there's obviously a West Bengal election because uh, the Home Minister was already in West Bengal even before the Bihar election was over. So that's the next battleground. And it's a strong, I mean, it's a battleground that people have been sort of raring at for a while. Obviously, the, the BJP is going to be on the front foot, shoulders back, slightly more confident here. Um, how do you think the Bihar election and the learnings from the Bihar election will play out in West Bengal now going forward? Uh, as you mentioned, it makes a difference to the morale of the BJP, yes. Uh, it doesn't make much of a difference to the morale of Mamta Banerjee. She's uh, a person by herself, a uh, woman in her own right, someone who has come from the ground. Uh, Mamatar Komata, 
as they say in Bengal, her kshamata, her capacity is, is quite of a different scale. Uh, so I don't think it will make a difference to that. In any case, as I said, Bihar is not the epicenter of North Indian politics, let alone West Bengal. West, you know, now different states are entirely different uh, worlds, political worlds. So the yes. pattern of Bihar is unlikely to travel to Uttar Pradesh, let alone West Bengal. West Bengal is a very different political alternatives, very different political culture, very different ideologies, organizations, and a different government. Uh, so next year, when we have four elections, which is Tamil Nadu, Kerala, West Bengal, and Assam, I do not think uh, one should draw any lesson in general from behalf of any of the other cities. The one important lesson we should think about, though, is this, and that applies uh, more in other states, because in West Bengal, there is a clear alternative. Uh, the, the one lesson is this, that you cannot simply rely on BJP's mistakes to win elections. You cannot simply think that the prime minister would slip up, which he does, but that alone cannot give you success. You have to come up with credible alternative, credible agenda. Now, this is not to, uh, to look away from what Tejasvi did. I think Tejasvi managed to make an election out of it. He worked very hard. Uh, he also identified two very correct things. One is that uh, governance was actually a weak point for Nitish. Second, and unemployment was uh, at least healed. Uh, however, he failed to provide an alternative. He failed to provide a clear, coherent uh, narrative in which he could appear credible. When he spoke about the failure of Nitish government, people believed him, but they also remembered the previous Lalu Prasad Yadav regime. Remember 2000, 2005 regime in Bihar is remembered rightly so as one of the most notorious regime. They call it Jungle Raj. Uh, I can say it very clearly. What they really mean to say was that there was a Yadav Raj that any Yadav could occupy your land and no one dare file an FIR against him. That's what was happening at that point. This memory stays in Bihar, the minds of non-Yadavs of Bihar even today. And when he spoke about unemployment, it is true that uh, people want employment, but his magic trick of 1 million employment on the first day that probably didn't click very much. So that is the problem. So what the opposition needs to do is to come up with better narrative, more credible faces, and in general, an a credible alternative. So simply waiting for BJP to falter is not enough. That is a clear message from Bihar. Well, you know, the, the interesting thing that people are now talking about is the five seats that the AIMIM got, um, you know, in Bihar. Um, OAC now talking about what he's, you know, what that actually means. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's interesting because we've never really seen a South Indian party, it's technically a South Indian party, make any sort of inroads outside of the South at all. This is the first time. Um, there have been some accusations that he split the vote and that he's being selfish and it's identity politics, but isn't everything identity politics right now? Where do you see this going forward? Is this going to play out more or was this a flash in a pan one time thing? It's not flash in the pan at all. Uh, and I must confess, I know many people will criticize, many people will uh, write on YouTube about all this. Let me be very honest. I'm actually worried about the rise of MIM. Uh, mm -hmm. Why am I worried? A South Indian party coming to North India should be welcomed. But as everyone knows, MIM does not come as a South Indian party. It comes as a Muslim party. Uh, well, in, even in that case, what's wrong with the Muslim party? You have Hindutva parties, you have Akali party. Uh, I would say, well, I'm not so happy with Hindutva parties. I'm not so happy with the Sikh party. I'm not so happy with the Christian party coming as Christian or Hindu as Sikh. So one should be worried. Uh, you would say, all right, you may be worried, but these things do happen in democracy. Now you have parties in Bihar, which are for one specific caste. Apna Dal is a Kurmi party. You have one, you know, what, what is HAM? What is VIP? All these are specific caste specific parties. Uh, why are you not worried so much about them? Why about this MIM, which has only five seats? My answer is this, look, uh, MIM has every right to come and contest every party. If caste parties can flourish in this country legally, why not? And if, and if BJP can flourish in this country legally, why not MIM? Legally, constitutionally, I see no difference. The only reason why I worry about the rise of MIM 
is because it comes from a complete failure of secular politics of this country. Muslims of this country actually never wanted to vote for Muslim exclusive parties, which were the Muslim parties favored by the Muslims of this country, except for Muslim League in Kerala, which is a very specific historical phenomena. It was the Congress party, it was the Janta Dal, it was the Samajwadi party, it was the RJD. These have been the standard parties favored by the Muslims. If Muslims go for Muslim exclusive parties, which is like AUDF in Assam, like MIM or about the Muslim, the, the Ulema Council in uh, Uttar Pradesh. This means that Muslims are now being pushed towards opting for Muslim exclusive parties. So in a sense, what the Muslims are saying is this, I have seen enough of your secularism. I have seen these parties. They use me as a hostage during elections and they do not care for me. And I now feel more comfortable with someone of my own. I, this, this to me is a severe indictment of secularism. But more than that, this is something which would further contribute to communal polarization of the country's politics because Mr. Oasis' politics, I know he would hate to hear this when I said, said a couple of times in his, apps, in his presence, he really got annoyed. But Mr. Oasis is the other side of the coin of RSS and the BJP. Both these things fuel each other. So I'm worried about MIM's rise. They have every legal right to be here, but I'm worried about their rise because it spells more trouble in the country as far as the communal uh, situation is concerned. And so, it also me, puts Muslims in a ghetto further. One question, if I may, and we've been actually talking about this over many elections, the lack of tickets being handed to Muslim candidates at all mm. in most, in most uh, you know, um, states. And, uh, you know, I remember an article written by the Times of India about how Congress's first round of tickets uh, had no Muslim candidates at all. So, I mean, there is a race even among uh, what you, what should be secular parties like the Congress to be either soft Hindu or almost Hindu or also Hindu in that case. Um, is that the problem? Is that why you're saying uh, the Muslim voter feels the need it's to look for their own? It's a structural problem. The, you know, so, so in a sense, the problem of the Indian Muslims is exactly the problem of the American Blacks. The hmm. Republicans don't care for the Blacks because the Blacks don't vote for the Republicans. Democrats don't, for the, don't do anything for the Blacks because they know Blacks have no option except to vote for Democrats. This is what has happened to Muslims. The BJP doesn't, the BJP knows that, they, the BJP doesn't want to do anything for them because it doesn't get their votes, doesn't want to get it now. And the Congress and other so-called secular parties know that they have no other option. So in, Muslims now want to break off from this in a situation where they are being pushed into second rate citizenship. They want to shake this up. They want to break off. And because they do not have secular parties which can just openly talk about these things, which do not practice this politics of hostage taking vis-a-vis -vis the Muslims. Muslims are just being used as hostage by secular parties. No secular yes. party talks about education, employment of the Muslims. So for every other community, you go and tell them you will get employment, you will get education, you will get road electricity. When it comes to Muslims, you say we will give you security. And that's all. So Muslims feel used, they want to break off. So I do not blame Muslims. I do not blame MIM. What I blame is the utter, utter failure of secular politics. It worries me, not because I happen to be for secular parties. I'm, I, I think of myself as a secular person, but not particularly enamored of secular politics of the kind that we have in the country. But I'm worried because this country's future is tied to some form of secularism remaining alive in the country. Otherwise, it's not just that secularism that goes for a six, India goes for a six. And that is why anything, if, if it's the rise of Shiv Sena, it worries me. If it's the rise of a certain kind of Sikh fundamentalism, it worries me. The rise of uh, BJP worries me, the rise of MIM worries me. My, my last question to you, and I know that we only have you till 9.30, is uh, not specifically about elections, but one of the things that got said repeatedly during the elections, something called a double engine uh, that the BJP kept referring to, saying that if you have the same government or allied governments in state and in center, it will function like two engines and you will see development happen much faster than you did if the two were at loggerheads. 
Uh, this actually brings me to worry about the federal system where states have a certain amount of power, center has power, they're meant to work together irrespective of which party runs these respective governments in order to provide service and development to citizens. Does, A, do you believe in the double engine theory? And uh, does that then worry you about what it means for all of the other states that are currently in disagreement with the central government? If the double engine theory worked, Bihar should have been doing wonderfully for the last uh, six, five years. Bihar has had double engine. Uh, Uttar Pradesh should have been the finest uh, state in the country because it has double engine. Um, so I mean, not this is the sheer political rhetoric of the low order. But to be absolutely fair, this is not the first time Mr. Modi has talked about it. And to be completely brutally frank, this is not for the first time any politician has spoken about mm -hmm. it. Mrs. Gandhi used to brazenly use this theory and say, you know, I'm in the center to give me votes at the state level. This is something she had used. Uh, these are, this is uh, poor rhetoric. In the case of Indira Gandhi, it was rhetoric. And when they did win, by and large, she would cooperate. Although, as we remember, in 1980, she managed to dismiss all the state governments without any single reason. So uh, these things have been done. And increasingly, Mr. Modi's politics reminds me of Indira Gandhi's politics, more than anyone from the BJP, more than Savarkar or any or Devras. It is Indira Gandhi politics. And the manner in which Indira Gandhi stymed federalism of this country, centralization of power, complete centralization of uh, national power in the hands of central government, central government's powers in the hands of executive, executive's power in the hands of one person. This is what Indira Gandhi did. This is what Mr. Modi is trying to do. And this is no good news for federalism in the country at all. All right, uh, Mr. Yadav, thank you so much for joining us and helping us understand uh, you know, the, the, the way forward of now that the Bihar elections are behind us and what this is going to mean. A quick question before I let you go. Before Bihar, we were talking about farmers a great deal. We were talking about the fact that in many states, farmers were upset. And I know that you continue to stay in touch and you're working on the ground. Uh, are they going to continue to protest? Should we expect more protests from farmers? Since yes, of course. Very, very, very big protest is already planned. 26th, 27th of this month, farmers of the country are doing Dilli Chalo. They are marching, walking, coming in tractors, trolleys to Delhi to protest. Uh, so that is actually the biggest mobilization so far that is planned. Uh, we gave a little... Uh, trailer of that on the 5th throughout the country by uh, blocking roads for four hours only because we didn't want to disturb the public very much. Um, and then 26th is the big one. Uh, the government is rattled. The government is trying to break the farmers by inviting only Punjab farmers to the meeting for the 13th. Uh, but farmers' unity is much deeper. And I'm sure in the next couple of weeks, we would see many instances of that. All right, Mr. Yadav, thank you so much and uh, have a good evening. I know that a lot of people have been calling you and you're a little unwell. I hope you feel better soon. Thank you for spending time with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure.